Few American cars are more iconic than a split-window Corvette. <laughs> Corvettes turn people into children. This is what happens. I can't think of a single person on this planet who would walk out to a garage, see a split window Corvette and go, nah, no, nah, I don't think so. Everyone loves them. It's one of the reasons why they're expensive, but it's worth it. The Corvette's been around for a long time though, right? It's one of the longest running nameplates in the history of the automobile, not just in America. And the C2 was something of the starting point for that. The C1 came first. It was a live axle car, didn't have a lot of room inside. They are great cars, but this was when Duntov and the guys at GM finally got a patch on a car that could take on the world. That's not to say it was perfect, but it did so, so much more than I think anybody expected from it at the time. And then, frankly, it did more than a lot of people expected from General Motors at the time, or Detroit in general. Even though it was the second generation Corvette, it was still the beginning of a long dynasty, right? Corvettes ended up going to Le Mans, the greatest endurance race in the world, and winning. They ended up winning sports car championships with the SCCA. They've won autocrosses, they've won hill climbs, the people have taken them to Bonneville. This is one of the most successful vehicles America has built, and the C2 was when it really started to coalesce. So the first generation Corvette was famously sleepy, had a live axle, only came with a six cylinder to start with, was just kind of a cushy boulevardier, whatever, fluffy, pretty thing, right? This is not that. The guy behind the Corvette, Zora Arcus Duntoff, decided and got permission from GM, which is critical, those are not the same things, got permission from GM to update the thing and make it more of a driver's car. They changed the rear suspension, it's independent now, based on experiments he had done prior to that with a car called the Serve One. It's wider, it's roomier inside, it's more comfortable, but but most of all, it just plain drives better. So, this was when America's sports car went from being America's sports car in name to America's sports car in reality. So when people talk about second generation Corvettes, the C2, the word that comes up constantly is split window. And the split window is this. This feature right here, this central rib that goes down the middle of the car, bisects the rear window into two separate pieces of glass. That means two things. One, it looks rad, and two, when you look in the rearview mirror, you see a like two to three inch brick of fiberglass right where the car behind you is. You can't see, you can see some, but not a lot out the back. That's one of the reasons they killed it for 64. 64s just have a single piece of glass. All things considered, it makes for a better car, I guess, but this looks so good. Now, that window came about because GM's chief designer, Bill Mitchell, one of the geniuses of 20th century automotive design and industrial design, period, went on vacation in the tropics. He saw stingrays floating in the water. Big, fat, wide fish, very thin, have a long tail and a central ribby spine. That's this. When you view the car from behind, it actually looks like a stingray. It comes to a V-shape, there's a point, there are points everywhere. It's cohesive, it's delicate, it's brutish all at once, and it's amazing. All early C2s had a 327, made between 250 and 360 horsepower. Came with either a two-speed automatic, a three-speed manual, or a four-speed manual. Those 360 horse cars are Rochester mechanical fuel injection. It uses fuel pressure and vacuum signals to tell a mechanical brain of sorts how much fuel to give to the motor. Because it's a pretty simple system, it doesn't like cold starts, and drivability tends to be a little weird if they're not dialed in completely. Um, find somebody who knows what they're doing with one of them, because when they're right, they're pretty great. Not the, not the best thing in the world, but still pretty good. One of the cool things about this car is the rear suspension. So Duntov's experimental car, the Serve 1, gave its rear suspension to this. It uses the drive shafts, the half shafts, as the upper link. There's a short link in the lower, and all the springing is done by this monoleaf. That is one leaf out of a large leaf spring, right? So on the one hand, simple, cool, neat, actually let's car put the power down. But on the other hand, like everything here, Maintenance is critical to how the car handles and how it behaves. And because these things are so pretty and tend to be worth so much money and generally used for a lot of cruising, not 
high stress driving, not intensive stuff, sometimes maintenance can get neglected, right? These U-joints, if they get snatchy, bindy, grindy, that can limit how the car puts its power down, limit how compliant it is. It makes it harder to drive quickly, right? Corvettes are not easy cars to drive quickly. That's part of what makes them great, but you don't want to make that any more difficult than it has to be. So the other thing is the brakes. These aren't complicated cars. This is all simple stuff, but it's still important. Corvettes had drum brakes until 1965 when they got Kelsey Hayes discs that lasted for a couple of decades. And these things are fine around town. They're even fine for kind of spirited driving, but they will fade, they do go away, and the car makes a lot of power without much grip. Even with modern tires on it, they still want for grip and they want for brakes. If you buy one of these, and if you're looking at one, condition of the brakes is critical, largely because it's indicative of the condition of the rest of the car. If the car has great brakes and they feel good, it stops well, there's not a lot of fade in normal driving, you can probably guess that the rest of the thing has been taken care of. And in a 300 plus horsepower car with not a lot of tire, you want it to stop and turn as well as possible. So the fiberglass is cool, right? Doesn't rust, easy, simple. But the downside is that because it's not metal, everybody thinks they can do it. How difficult should it be to repair fiberglass, right? It's basically big paper mache, resin mat goes together. Turns out, no, it's not. This isn't just fiberglass. This is fiberglass that does 150 miles an hour, that sees potholes, that sees rain, that sees heat, that changes and expands, that has a 300 plus horsepower V8 sitting in the front of it. It is intensely stressed. Couple of stress cracks, normal. Some expansion around the seam seals, normal. It moves, it shrinks. If the car has any age on it and any mileage, it will look a little used. But what you wanna be careful of is awful bodywork. And on Corvettes, especially the desirable ones, awful bodywork is rampant. If you see visible seams, if you see massive shrinkage, if you see evidence of Bondo, anything that makes it look like the car's been cobbled together, run screaming. It takes time and effort to put these cars right, and there are very few people who do them extremely well. Be cautious. GM built more than 100,000 examples of the C2 Corvette, so you've got plenty of options, but the specific Corvette you pick will have a huge impact on how much you spend. If you wanted a 1963 split window coupe like this one, a 327 in number three condition, it would have cost you about $36,000 in 2011. By early 2019, that price had more than doubled to $80,000, which is about where it stayed through 2020. As always, values change over time, so please visit haggerty.com slash valuation tools for the most detailed and up-to-date information. These things are great. They're really satisfying to drive in a way that you can't quite put your finger on. The cliche is that they're underbraked and the bodies rattle and they ride okay but not great and you buy one for the looks. But in reality, there's so much more here. You can rail on a Corvette and get a lot out of it. And like most sports cars, it has things to say. You know, in period, everybody thought they were big and numb and kind of heavy, but they talk. You can feel the chassis and the body moving around underneath you. They ride pretty well. The engine, especially in this trim, is just a barrel of torque. They're not slow, even by modern standards. Although by modern standards, you want to be careful of the brakes because it's got a lot of power. But ultimately, it's just such a lovely package that it represents such a great time in GM's history and in America's history. So, should you buy one? Well, first off, it is an investment. No split window Corvette will ever be worth pennies. These are desirable cars. They didn't make a lot of them in the big scheme of things. And everyone agrees they look fantastic. Most people also agree they're great to drive, which means that if you're buying one to park it, maybe make a little money, walk out, stare at it in the way you would stare at a Picasso in your garage, you're probably gonna do okay. If you're buying it to drive it, it's basically Christmas. <laughs> Great cars make you forget the rest of the world. The split-window Corvette makes you forget other great cars. 